Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's book to show comparison for The Expanse Season 3, Episode 7, Delta V. This video is part of a series of videos where I compare The Expanse TV show to the novels, pointing out the differences and giving my opinion on how well I think these adaptations work. So I have to start with a spoiler warning for The Expanse up to the end of Season 3, uh, and I really mean it this time. If you have not seen all the way to the Season 3 finale, this video will definitely contain spoilers. So if you haven't seen all of Season 3, you will not want to watch this video, otherwise it will spoil you. This is your final warning. But if you have seen all of season three, but haven't read the novels, not to worry, this video will not contain future spoilers beyond season three. So before I get into any details of the episode, I feel I need to make a general statement about Abaddon's Gate, which is the third novel in the Expanse series, uh, which this and the rest of the episodes of season three cover. I mentioned this on my channel uh, many times before, but this was my favorite novel in the Expanse series, and unlike the two previous novels, I don't think the show quite lived up to its source material, mainly because I felt like they rushed through the material. Book 1, Leviathan Wakes, the show took about 15 episodes to cover that material. Book 2, Caliban's War, the show took about 14 episodes to cover that material. With the Baden's Gate, the show took a mere 7 episodes to cover it, which is literally half the time it took to cover the other books. In this one episode alone, it covers nearly a quarter of a Baden's Gate mostly skipping over uh, the source material. Now, even though it has been stated um, that those running the show didn't know for certain that the show would be canceled after Season 3 when they were making Season 3, I strongly believe that they at least suspected that the show would be canceled and they could see which way the wind was blowing with sci-fi, so they didn't want to end Season 3 with a cliffhanger just in case the show was cancelled, so they wanted to reach the end of book three by the end of season three, and I believe in order to do this, they had to rush through the source material, and a lot of important character beats and interesting storylines were lost in the process. So although I do like season three a lot, including the second half, these videos are about comparing the show to the novels, which in the case of Abaddon's Gate, Overall, I don't think they hold up to, so you may find I'm a little harsher on the next coming episodes. I'm not entirely certain that this will be the case, but I suspect it will be. We'll just have to see. Regardless, let's get on with analyzing this episode. So we open on Earth with Avicerala giving a speech as she is now apparently the Secretary General of the UN because Gillis resigned and Aaron Wright was arrested for treason, leaving Avicerala next in line. Uh, they failed to mention why Gillis resigned to explore this further, but I suppose we are led to believe he didn't want to tarnish his legacy, or perhaps maybe Avicerala pushed him out for being such a coward. We're never told, so we can only guess. Anyway, Avicerala's speech is about how, although uh, there'd be a lot of hard feelings after the recent wars, that we need to leave our desires for revenge behind and instead focus on peace because of the looming mysteries, mysterious threat of the Predator Molecule, all humanity must come together, united to protect the uh, survival of the human race. And I do wonder if Pastor Anna wrote this speech, as it sounds very similar to the speech she tried to write for Gillis before Aaron Wright corrupted it. Anyway, um, while Avicerala finishes her speech, we're treated to a visual of a weird Predator Molecule thingy flying out in space, transforming itself. It eventually forms a giant ring, which the subtitle identifies it simply as The Ring, which is beyond the orbit of Uranus. Now, in the novels, Avicerala doesn't become Secretary General until Book 5, the details of which I won't get into here, but suffice to say that in the novels at this stage, uh, Sorrento Gillis is still the Secretary General. Although by the end of the novel, there's another election, and he loses that election, but not to Avicerala, but to another candidate. But it's assumed by those with political know-how that Avicerala was responsible for the change in regime, 
and somehow helped Gillis to lose. However, at the end of Caliban's War, there is a scene of a peace summit on Luna with the UN Martians and OPA delegates in attendance that does convey the general message being expressed here that all of humanity is coming together to deal with the protomolecule threat. As for the ring, I think this is explained a lot better here. As in the novels, at least a year had passed between the events of book two and three. And at the start of book three, they talk about the ring like it's already there. And we hear mostly about it through newscasts and characters talking about it. When I was reading the novels, it gave me the feeling that I missed a chapter. Like I forgot to read something, but I didn't. So I like this speech for Avicarella so much better than hearing about it in like newscasts. I think it sets the stage for what is to come and makes it clear exactly what the ring is. So I'm going to give this a plus four. So next we go over to a belter slingshot daredevil named Maneo on a tiny ship called the EK. He apparently is known for setting records doing dangerous slingshots around planetoids. We see him psyching himself up uh, for his next record breaking slingshot around Saturn which is unprecedented and he feels will make him famous. He sends a message uh, to his girlfriend back on series telling her that when he returns she'll be banging a superstar. However, when he watches the news to see what they are saying about him, the story about him breaking records is interrupted by a news story on the ring and how Avicerella is sending a large fleet there that includes civilians like artists and religious leaders. The interruption upsets him, but he's sure that when he breaks the biggest record, people will stand up and notice him. So he does a slingshot, which is very dangerous, and he barely manages to survive uh, just with a bloody nose. But when he turns on the news to see what they're saying about him, the news only talks about the ring. This time reporting that James Holden, hero to the belt, will be visiting the ring. This really upsets Maneo, but um, matters get worse when he receives a message from his girlfriend Evita, who complains that she's lonely while waiting for him to come back, so she sought out the company of his brother, who we then see walk by wearing nothing but a Speedo that tells him to be safe out there. This, of course, causes him to become quite depressed, and he drinks alone on, the, on his ship while listening to sad music until he comes up with an idea. He then sends a message to Evita telling her that he's going to do something so big uh, that she's going to come back to him and love him again. And his idea is, of course, to slingshot into the ring. So in the novels, Maneo's story is told in the prologue of Abaddon's Gate, where here it's broken up into several scenes and told throughout the episode. And this is how the novel introduces the reader to the concept of the ring, which as I already mentioned, I thought was a poor way to do it. And in the novel, Maneo is described as a young 18-year-old, uh, where here the actor looks a bit older than that to me. It was described that he got into slingshotting as a way to prove himself as he grew up on series, but his father was an earther, so he was picked on because of that. And slingshotting was described more as an underground illegal sport uh, that gangsters uh, ran betting pools on, whereas here it's portray portrayed as a legitimate uh, extreme sport that makes national news. In fact, the way it's described in the novels was more closely portrayed in season one, where Miller came across an underground gambling syndicate where people bet on whether or not a slingshotter would survive. In the novels, Veda was not his girlfriend, but his cousin, whom he had a crush on, but he was hoping to win her affections by doing these slingshots. So, I actually like the show's version better here, as it's less confusing after Avicerala's explanation of what the ring is, and it adds humor to Maneo's backstory. The scene with his brother walking by in a speedo was hilarious, uh, whereas his backstory in the novels was kind of boring, so I'm going to give this a plus three. So then we go over to the Rosinante where we see a documentarian named Monica Stewart interviewing Holden while they're on their way to the ring. 
Monica asks Holden how he managed to be involved in some of the most important events in recent history, and he answers that he's just lucky. She then asks uh, why he's going out to the ring, and he says uh, because she's paying him to do so. Uh, she then asks him what he thinks of the ring, and he answers that it makes him want a donut, and she points out that he's deflecting. Uh, they're now in the command center where Amos is working, and uh, Monica is accompanied by her cameraman, Cohen, who also happens to be blind, but due to implants can operate a camera. Uh, then uh, she mentions that the Rosinante was stolen, but Alex quickly slides down the ladder and corrects her that it's legitimate salvage. She then fights back that the Martians claim otherwise, and apparently are suing them to get back uh, the Rosinante, and the only reason reason why Holden agreed to have Monica Stewart on board was because she's paying for his legal fees. Alex expresses interest in being interviewed about the Rosinante, but Monica sort of brushes him off and instead is interested in Amos and asks why he's on the Rosinante, and he says he's going to be on a ship regardless of which ship it is, and at least this ship is part his. Holden then explains that they each own quarter shares in the Rosnate, but uh, Monica points out that there's only three of them, so then asks what happened to Naomi Nagata. So, okay, there's a lot to unpack in this scene as it skipped over a lot of events that occurred in the novels. First off in the novel's name, is still in the Rosinante, she never left. And the story begins after Maneu smashes into the ring, and apparently at the exact same time, Miller appears to Holden yet again, telling him that something was wrong, except this time Hold, uh, Miller is a lot more coherent. So Holden figures that Miller is connected with the ring, and that scares him, and so he wants to get as far from the ring as possible. So Holden takes a job from some sketchy gangster types to deliver what is very likely contraband to Titania, a moon of Uranus. When Naomi asks why he would take such a job, which they would usually avoid, Holden shows her a map of the solar system, which at this point uh, Uranus uh, currently... Uh, was in the opposite side of the solar system from the ring, meaning that it's the furthest possible distance from the ring where humans are. But when they go to take delivery uh, of the contraband, the gangsters suddenly back out as something got them spooked, and they warn Holden to leave Ceres immediately. Uh, they detect someone is heading their way, so Holden and Amos go out with guns, expecting an armed party uh, while Alex fires up the Rossi. However, instead of armed invaders, they find a young woman Holden describes as looking like a supermodel smiling and asking if he's James Holden. When he answers that he is, she hands him a hand terminal that's apparently a summons and she tells him that he's been served and then leaves. Holden reads the summons to find that the Martians are officially suing him for the Rosinante uh, challenging their salvage claim and they're suing in earth and martian courts meaning this place the places they could go uh, to run are few and far between uh, the Rosinate is then put on lockdown and they are stuck on series until the situation is resolved during the coming weeks, Holden contacts several lawyers and discovers that whether they can win the case or not is uncertain, but what is certain is that it would cost him a lot of money to try. Eventually, he's contacted by Monica Stewart, who wants him to take her to the ring and offers him a hefty sum which he could really use to pay his legal fees. But more than that, she can backdate their employment and get special dispensation for the Rosinante to leave series so that the Rosinante will no longer be in lockdown which gives the Rosinante the option to run. Even though the ring is the last place he wants to go, he agrees because it's their only option, but Holden is convinced that Miller is behind this to force him to go to the ring because it's all too much of to just be a coincidence and he suspects that he's being played. Now, it turns out that he's right about being played, but wrong about who is playing him. As really, it was Melba, a.k.a. Clarissa Mal, who set the whole thing up uh, with the Martian suing them and Monica Stewart coming to his rescue in order to get the Rosnati to the ring with her man on board. 
So anyway, when Monica does come on board, it's not just her and Cohen. There's four people in her team, including herself. There's her, Cohen, a guy named Clip, and a woman named Okja. And in the novels, Cohen isn't a camera operator. He's the sound guy, which kind of makes more sense for a blind man. But anyway, uh, once on board, Alex doesn't try to talk to her. Uh, like he does here. It's in fact Amos who cozies up to her, uh, but it's just because he's hitting on her and also Okja. But Naomi, Alex, and Amos all go to Holden and ask him to keep Monica busy so she doesn't bother them because none of them want her prying into their past as they all went to the Canterbury in the first place to hide from their past. So Holden actually cooperates with Monica in order to keep her distracted and away from the others. Also, the part about all four of them owning the Rosinante also happened in the books, but it was decided during the events of Caliban's War. Now, the show doesn't make it very clear that the Rosinante is a ship for hire going from job to job, since the show blended the events of Leviathan and Wakes and Caliban's War. Ever since the Canterbury was destroyed, the four of them has just been on the run dealing with the protomolecule crisis ever since, and this is the first time we see the crew after those events be a legitimate shift for hire and the show just kind of glosses over it. Whereas in the novels this has been firmly established for some time and further establishes such as the you know smuggler smuggling contraband for gangsters story that they just had. Also I found it incredibly jarring to just jump straight into Monica Stewart being on board without properly setting her up and I feel the show severely downplayed the importance of the Martian suing them for the Rosinante and kind of just threw it out there as an in insignificant excuse as to why Monica's there as they never actually explain that this was all Clarissa Mal's doing nor do they even resolve the situation whereas at the end of Abaddon's Gate, Anna gets her friend Tilly to make the lawsuit disappear as a favor to her. And of course, having the whole uh, sequence with the summons and the ship on lockdown really raised the stakes and the tension that was solely missing here. So I'm going to give this a negative five. So then we go over to the behemoth, the ship that was once the Nauvoo, but the OPA has uh, retrofitted it as a battleship. We see that Naomi is serving on the behemoth as its chief engineer under its captain, Kamina Drummer. Drummer scolds Naomi for being late as they approach the airlock, and Naomi simply notes that she's in a bad mood and warns that they knew the day was coming, but Drummer isn't happy about it. As apparently, even though Fred Johnson was the one responsible for retrofitting the behemoth, he made a deal with Anderson Dawes to have equal representation on the ship since it's supposed to represent all of the OPA and they're going to the airlock to meet Dawes' representative who turns out to be a man named Klaus Ashford who apparently is a known pirate. Ashford is to serve as Drummer's first officer and when he asks permission to come on board Drummer asks if she can say no and Ashford tells her that she cannot. Ashford then introduced the youngest member of his team, Diago, and Naomi uh, tells her, uh, Naomi flips out because Diago betrayed Fred Johnson, but apparently Dolls made a deal with Johnson to allow Diago to be part of her crew. Diago then tries to uh, taunt her by telling her that Cotazar says hello, but Ashford scolds him. Uh, for saying this to Naomi and says that Naomi has done more for the belt than he ever would and that Drummer is his captain and he apologizes. Drummer then welcomes him to the behemoth and then departs. Ashford then tells Naomi that he can feel the love already. So, in the novels, it was a very, very different situation on the behemoth. Um, the characters of Drummer, naming Ashford, are stand-ins for the book characters of Bull, Sam, Michio Pa, and Ashford. In the novels, Naming never joins the OPA or serves on the behemoth, as I mentioned. Instead, we follow the viewpoint character of Carlos de Baca, otherwise known as Bull. 
Bull is an Arthur friend of Fred Johnson, who's an experienced and well-trained officer who serves the OPA and was initially made first officer of the behemoth, uh, even though he felt he deserved to be the captain. However, he was then demoted to second officer and chief of security, mainly for political reasons because Johnson was an earther and they didn't want to have too many earthers in high positions, uh, so they wanted the captain and first officer both to be belters. The captain of the behemoth was Captain Ashford, who was not so experienced and was more worried about his career. Bull had a very low opinion of Ashford, whom he saw as an opportunist who was not capable of his job that he was given. Ashford's new first officer was Michio Pa, a very young, but uh, Bull thought maybe too young, but Bull ultimately did like her, but she wasn't too fond of Bull. The last character is Sam, the chief engineer. Sam had appeared in previous novels repairing the Rosinante and was friends with the crew, particularly Naomi. Here, Sam is friends with Bull, uh, but that will soon get her in trouble. So it seems to me that Naomi is a direct stand-in for Sam, as they're both the chief engineer, they're both friends with the Rosinante, and they are both friends with the main character on the behemoth, in Naomi's case, Drummer, in uh, Sam's case, Bull. Drummer and Ashford are a bit more complicated. Now, as I mentioned in previous videos, Drummer doesn't appear in the novels until book five, and at first isn't really given much to do. But it seems that the show has blended characteristics of Bull and Book Ashford into Drummer and Show Ashford. For example, in the show, Drummer is the inexperienced one who is a captain uh, like uh, Book Ashford, and, and Show Ashford is more experienced one who thinks he's more qualified to be captain like Bull. However, it's clear that Drummer is someone the audience is supposed to get behind like Bull, whereas both versions of Ashford turn uh, out to be more of an antagonist. And Drummer also has elements of Michio Pa in terms of being a young female angsty officer that some believe is too young to be in a position of command. And Diago doesn't factor into the novels at all as he was not in these novels at all. Also, the situation with Johnson and Dolls coming to a truce that makes Dolls' man the first officer did not exist in the books. Fred Johnson had ultimate control of the OPA, although it was unsteady, which is why he had to make political moves, such as giving command to, of the behemoth to an inexperienced captain that doesn't deserve it. My main complaint with this change is... I prefer Book Ashford as a very clear and realistic antagonist, someone who is incompetent but in power for political reasons, where Show Ashford, being more experienced than Drummer, changes dynamic in a way I don't like, so I'm going to give this a negative three. So, then we go aboard the Thomas Prince, a UNN battleship on its way to the ring, carrying a contingent of VIP civilians. Of these VIPs, we see Pastor Anna on the CIC, and she starts up a conversation with a scientist named Kovord, and they discuss what the ring might be. Kovord asks Anna if she's rich or a celebrity, and when she answers neither, he then asks how she got on the ship then, and she says that the Secretary General made her an offer that she couldn't refuse. Anna then says that she thinks the proto molecule may be a life form, and Kovord says that uh, isn't she part of the the God contingency, and Anna replies that she came here in a spaceship, not the wings of an angel, and that she can appreciate the difference. Kavord then says that he doesn't believe it's a life form, but technology from an extremely old and far more advanced species. When Anna asks him what he thinks it is, he answers by saying, pray that it's inert. So in the novels, Anna does go on the Thomas Prince as part of a civilian contingency, but she's not that important. She's applied for a spot on the ship, but she was competing with at least 200 other people for that spot and felt lucky that she managed to get it. Once on board, they didn't go to the CIC, but the civilians mainly talked amongst themselves and not 
scientists on board and were mostly contained in recreational areas or places like the mess hall. The conversations we saw Anna having was mostly with other religious figures and a few characters that the show will introduce a bit later, so I'll get into them when, in later episodes when they're introduced. As for Cavord, this character was not in the novels and it uh, was invented just for the show so they didn't do the whole science versus faith thing that we do here, but a lot of discussion that was had about the protomolecule. In fact, at the first big function, a man tried to set himself on fire to protest the oppression of the Afghan people, but uh, the ship's fire suppression put him out and prevented him from doing so, and this was mostly inconsequential to the main plot, but mainly there to illustrate how chaotic the civilian populace on the Thomas Prince was and how easy uh, they all were going to the ring. And this scene implies that Anna is there because Ava Sorella asked her to go, whereas in the novel she's a lot less important uh, than that and is seen more as a minor figure amongst the civilians. I'm not really sure why the show felt the need to change the situation or not introduce the other characters now and instead create this Cavord character who seems mostly unnecessary, so I'm going to give this a negative 2. So then we go back to the Rosinante where Alex is making dinner while the documentary team is filming him and he gives a rundown of all the food that they eat on a ship like this. However, Monica tries to ask him more personal questions about his family. Alex quickly answers them but tries to change the subject. But then Amos comes in uh, to eat and Monica quickly switches focus to him and asks how he came to be a mechanic on a gunship, asking him questions like who his mentor was and when Amos answers he didn't have one. She talks about how unusual it is for someone to go from basic to working as a mechanic in a space. Uh, she then asks him where he's from and he says no place in particular but she says that he's from Baltimore and she did some checking and found that there was an Amos, Amos Burton from Baltimore who was some kind of crime lord but Amos says it's just a common name. During the questioning, Cohen brings the camera, camera in close to get a close-up of Amos as he's being grilled. Losing his temper, Amos then smashes the camera and Cohen, upset, tells him that he'll have to pay for it. He then leaves the mess and Monica quickly follows him and says that she's sorry, but Amos tells her that she isn't. Monica then suggests that perhaps he's the type who gets all chatty after sex as she's coming on to him, but he whispers in her ear that he doesn't shit where he eats and then walks off. Now in the novels, there was a scene where Holden invited Monica and her crew to have dinner with them, so the eight of them sat down and to enjoy a meal. Monica started complaining that uh, she and her crew didn't feel welcomed on board and that they haven't given them any interviews uh, since the weeks that they've been on the ship, and that was part of the deal. Amos, being all flirty, tells her that she can interview him, so she asks him about Baltimore, which shuts him up and gets him really upset. Holden then promises Monica the interviews that she wants with him. Clip then tries to make casual conversation with Amos about Baltimore, but he ignores it. So what's funny is in the novels, it was Amos that came on to Monica Stewart, not the other way around. In fact, it's said that he flirted with both Monica and Okja until he was rejected. But once Monica started asking him about personal questions, he stopped flirting. Monica never tried to flirt with Amos like she did here to use sex to get him to talk, which seems a bit unprofessional, as in the novels Monica was strictly professional, which makes more sense to me, and as much as I love the scene where Amos smashes the camera, I think the overall direction of Monica's character makes more sense in the novels, so I'm going to give this a negative 2. We then go back to the behemoth where Naomi, Drummer, and Ashford are on their way up to the CIC while Naomi explains to Ashford all the issues with the behemoth and how it was made, uh, t you know, made to be a ship of exploration and while it looks mean, it's actually pretty crappy as a battleship. Ashford simply muses how it's a great symbol that the belt is strong. When they arrive at the CIC, Ashford 
uh, sees a man he recognizes named Grigori and taps him on the shoulder to say hello. Grigori responds by attacking Ashford, but Ashford immediately gets the better of him and puts him in a chokehold. Ashford then tells Grigori that he was going to apologize, and then he does so and asks if he'll stand down. Grigori agrees, so Ashford lets him go. Ashford and Drummer then go to the captain's office where they talk in private. Drummer accuses Ashford of believing he should be in command, not her, which he doesn't deny, but he says it's not about what people deserve, it's about politics, and she's the, more the politically smart move. He then outlines the situation that Fred Johnson has the protomolecule and Dolls has Kotazar, which means they have equal power and they need to work together for the good of the Belter state. Drummer uh, still seems dubious, but Ashford insists that he's committed to making this work. Now, the part about the behemoth sucking as a battleship in the novels was told to the audience through Buell's, uh, Bull's musings rather than through dialogue, but the end of result is the same. Ashford having a foe in Grigori hints at a deeper pass, uh, one that is never really explained in detail in the show, but is meant to convey the general idea that Ashford was a nasty pirate who screwed a lot of people over in the past, but is now committed to do the right thing to the belt. This, of course, is completely different than his book counterpart, who is portrayed more as an incompetent bureaucrat. And there isn't a pirate character in the books. Uh, that's something that the show made up. As is Grigori, a character that doesn't exist in the novels. As for Ashford's conversation with Drummer, this is similar in the books as an incompetent captain is put in command of the behemoth because of politics, but in the novels, it's Ashford, not Drummer. And the situation with there being a standstill between two different factions in the OPA and them having to work together for the greater good does not exist in the novels. The novels do describe the OPA as being made up of many minor factions with their own petty disputes with each other, but we don't see this in action like we do here, which I think is an improvement, so I'm going to give this a plus one. So then Drummer, Ashford, and Naomi are alerted to a crisis in progress, and we see that a skiff that was working uh, off the outer skin of the ship has went haywired and is in danger of damaging the ship. They quickly work to solve the situation and manage to get the skiff inside before it does any damage. The driver, however, has overdosed on pixie dust, a uh, heavy narcotic. Naomi recognizes the man as having seen him buy the drugs from a drug dealer. She regrets now not doing more to stop it. So she tells Drummer in private what she knows about this, but Drummer tries to say it isn't her fault because she didn't control the sell of illegal drugs. But she asks Naomi if she knew who the dealer was, and when she says that she does and tells Drummer who it is, she goes charging off. So in the novels, we didn't see the accident happen, quote-unquote, on screen, so to speak, but rather, Bull read about it in some reports. And the nature of the accident was different as it happened inside rather than outside the behemoth, and it was a man driving a mech. He ran over another man who was severely injured and taken to the med bay, where it was said that he would take weeks to recover. And while... Uh, they tested the injured man for drugs who turned out to be clean. They didn't test the man who was driving the mech. Bull suspected that he was on drugs, so he went to Sam about this. And Sam confirms in general that a lot of her crew does take drugs. But when Bull asks her for a name of a dealer, Sam refuses to tell him, worried that she'll be seen as a snitch. But Bull guilts her into it, and eventually she gives him a name. But either way, it works for me, so I'm going to give this a zero. So next, we go back to the Rosinante, where we see Alex talking to Bobby Draper over the comms. Uh, Draper is back on duty as a Marine on a Martian warship. She tells Alex about visiting Mars and how it was good to see the planet again, and Alex admits to being jealous of her. She tells him that she looked in on his wife and son for him, and that his son was really great and his wife was polite. Alex tells Bobby that she filed for divorce and he admits to being a bit relieved and asks if that makes him an asshole. But Bobby says no because she's not much for civilian life either. 
We also see that a good portion of this conversation is being filmed by the documentary uh, team, uh, although Alex isn't aware of this. Bobby then tells Alex that regardless of what her fellow Marines think of how they took ownership of that ship, that Alex is a top-notch pilot that can fly her any time. Alex seems honored and then signs off. So in the novels, Bobby Draper doesn't appear in book three at all, but it is implied at the end of book two that she is did in fact not return to active duty, but instead returned to Mars to be with her father and brother. And in the prologue of book four, we see her on Mars as a civilian working with veteran outreach programs. Also, we never see Alex communicating with her in such a way, but it's possible that this could have occurred quote unquote off screen. Also, as I mentioned in earlier videos in the novels, Alex was already divorced before joining the Rosinate, and he didn't have any children, so this part is different as well. This, I think, was a great scene and a nice added touch to the show uh, that show that Alex and Bobby are keeping in contact, plus the fact that Bobby is still Marine has implications that she will appear later in the story, uh, which she didn't in the books, and I like her inclusion in the story. Also, this was just a very touching scene that shows how close Alex and Bobby had become, which is also the case in the novels. We just weren't reminded of that in book three, which I think is important to do so. So I want to give this a plus three. We then go back to the Thomas Prince, where we see Pastor Anna getting a message from her wife, Nono, where Nono tells her that Alvisarella has been true to her wor word and is supporting the clinic, and it has never been in better shape. But at the same time, she's never felt worse because she's worried about Anna being so close to the ring and begs her to come home soon. This brings Anna to tears as she plays the message. Now, in the novels, when we first meet Pastor Anna, she's on Europa, where she has been living for the past two years as a missionary of sorts, and when she gets the invitation to join the mission to the ring, Nono tells her to go, but informs her that she's taking their daughter back to Earth, to Russia, to meet her family. Anna is at first worried that Nono is leaving her, but she says Anna can come back to her once the mission is done. Nono is more concerned that their daughter Nami is, uh, if she stays in Europe for too long, that she will be raised as a belter and will no longer have the bone structure to return to Earth, so she wants to take her back to Earth before that happens. And although we never see Anna getting a message from her wife like this during the, on the Thomas Prince, it is in keeping with the sentiments of her being proud of Anna for being out there, but at the same time wanting her to come home. The show is hinting at Avicerella bribing Anna to go to the ring with uh, supporting her clinic, but it still isn't very clear to me why she wants her there, so I'm going to give this a negative one. So we stay on the Thomas Prince, but switch to a skiff that is leaving the Thomas Prince, going to another ship in the fleet. On the skiff, we're introduced to Melba Coe, a rookie electrician, and her teammates uh, Stani and her boss Ren. Ren suggests to Melba that she clock in before showering and call it decontamination so she can get paid more. Melba is thankful for the advice and says that she'll do that, while Stani uh, teases Ren about knowing all the ways to cheat the system. Stani then goes on to talk about James Holden and how he's always involved in everything and now he's going to the ring. He then teases Melba, showing her a picture of Holden asking her if she likes what she sees, but she replies that she wouldn't rub up against that narcissistic asshole with his junk. Then we see them board the Sun Un to do repairs. Malba seems overwhelmed with the work, but Ren tries to make her feel better, telling her that the first contract is always the hardest, and as she has any questions, she should feel free to ask. She's very appreciative, but as soon as Ren leaves, she pulls out and plants what appears to be a bomb. So, now's the time to get into Melba Co. In the novel, she's introduced to us immediately as Clarissa Mal. They don't withhold this information from us like the show does. We also know instantly that her plan is to get revenge on James Holden for what he did 
to her father. When we first meet her, she's going to a dangerous part of Baltimore to do some sort of deal. She ends up uh, in a tough guy bar where the bartender there assumes that she's lost, but really she wants to meet with a gangster. We soon learn that she had arranged to purchase from him a new identity for herself as Melba Coe, an electrician who will be assigned to a UN ship going to the ring. However, when the gangster discovers who she really is, uh, he uh, tries to shake her down to become partners in her endeavor, and when she refuses, he threatens not only not to give her her new identity, but also to alert the authorities to who she really is, and he has a couple of thugs there to back up his threats. However, Clarissa uses her implants, which I'll get into later, to kill the gangsters and his thugs and take her new identity by force. Forced. The next time we see her, she's an electrician on the UN fleet. However, rather than being a novice as she is in the show, she's in a position as the team leader where Ren and Stani work for her. There's also a fourth member of her team, Soledad, but we'll meet her in the show a bit later. In the novel, Stani is a bit of a jerk to her, and Ren is nice to her as in the show. However, in the novels, Ren is much younger, and also Ren is a belter, so also a bit of an outsider. She listens on a private channel between them to find Stani is complaining about her and how she isn't qualified to be their supervisor. So Melba goes to Ren and asks her why that is, and Ren tells her that she made some mistakes that could eventually lead to the ship. Uh, being in serious danger. Melba then says that Stani is right, that she doesn't deserve the job, and she was just given it for political reasons, and she starts to break down. But Ren makes a point to try to make her feel better, and tells her that he'll help her improve. So the show stays true to the general dynamic between Melba and her workmates, but I think the book takes a lot more time to set this up and to show how nice Rin is uh, to Melba and how much uh, she appreciates him, unlike the show which only has Rin in a couple of brief scenes before he's killed. Therefore, you buy the guilt Melba feels over having to kill him much more in the books. Also, the whole setup of the gangsters in Baltimore did a lot more to establish Clarissa Mallon, who she is, and I really don't think uh, that's worth the sacrifice just so they can have a big surprise shock when they reveal who she really is later. So I'm going to give this a negative five. So then we go back to the Rosinate where we see Amos uh, setting up some plants on some panels. When Cohen comes in to ask him what he's doing, he explains that they call them Prax panels. And when Cohen asks what a Prax is, Amos explains who Prax is and describes him as his best friend in the whole world, which is exactly how Prax described him to May when they first rescued her. Cohen asks Amos where Prax is now, and Amos answers that he's back on Ganymede rebuilding with his daughter. Cohen then asks Amos why he didn't go with him, and Amos answers that he didn't ask, plus he's not really the rebuilding type. Cohen then puts his hand on his shoulder and tells him that he heard that he turned down Monica and wonders if that means he has a chance. Amos repeats what he told Monica, that he doesn't shit where he eats. So in the novels, Cohen never hits on Amos. As I said, Amos hits on Monica and Okja and both reject him and that's it. I think it's a bit ridiculous that both documentarians try to resort to sex to gain their subject to talk. However, that was actually really touching to hear Amos call Prax his best friend in the whole world. As I mentioned earlier, Prax and Amos were never as close uh, in the novel, so we didn't get any mention of Prax in book three at all. But this was not only touching, but denotes serious character development for Amos, as it's obviously having a best friend is a new concept for him, and you can tell that it really changed him. So I'm going to give this a plus two. So then we go back to the behemoth where we see a drummer dragging a beaten man through a crowded cargo bay as a security man drag another beaten man behind her. Drummer tosses the beaten man in the airlock. Naomi comes in and begs Drummer not to do this, but Drummer tells her to walk away. The beaten man security is holding is the drug dealer that Naomi saw earlier, and the man in the airlock is his supplier.
Drummy tells a uh, drummer tells Naomi she's going to blow the supplier out of the airlock while the dealer watches. But uh, just as she prepares to do so, Ashford comes in and asks if he can speak to her. She says in a minute, and he says now. Ashford then tells her that if the belt wants to be seen as equal to the great powers of Earth and Mars, they can't behave like barbarians. Naomi backs him up, and she backs down and lets the supplier out of the airlock. She then makes an announcement that if anyone has any contraband, they can just uh, put it in the airlock for the next 24 hours with no reason repercussions but after that and then Ashford interrupts and says after that anyone caught dealing will be thrown in the brig for the rest of the journey and then taken back the series for incarceration and then he tells everyone to clear out he nods to her but she still just looks upset so things went down a bit differently in the books. In the novels, Bull finds out who is dealing and he watches him for several days to make sure there isn't a bigger fish above him. When he's sure that there isn't, he goes into his locker and finds the duffel bag full of drugs. He then goes to the dealer in the middle of his shift and beats him up and puts him on the cart and drags him across the most public route to the airlock that he can find. Once at the airlock, Bull throws him in and then promptly blows him out into space. After spacing the man, he closes the outer airlock and opens the inner one and tells everyone that they have 48 hours to put any contraband in there with no questions asked. He leaves uh, the or else implied. Captain Ashford and Michio Pa don't hear about this until afterwards, and they are pissed. Ashford relieves him of duty and confines him to his quarters until they return to Ceres, where he will be tried for murder. Bull then asks Ashford if he's running a space station or a battleship. As on a space station, there are cops who arrest people, but he was under the impression that they were on a battleship, in which it is OPA tradition to space anyone who puts the lives of everyone else on the ship in danger. He said that he purposely didn't shoot or hang the man, he spaced him according to Belter tradition, as anyone who puts the lives of everyone else at risk deserves to be spaced. Ashford then lets Bull go, uh, but tells him that in the future he will come to Ashford first before taking any such action, as if anyone else is to be spaced, Ashford will decide. He leaves scolded, but returns to duty. Later, he receives a message from Michio Pa, who says that she can see how he manipulated Ashford by wrapping himself in the OPA flag and made it clear that she'll be watching him. So Bull realized that he made an enemy out of Pa, which he is very sorry for as he respects her. As for which one I like better, I think I'm going to have to go with the books as this act was actually portrayed as the smart thing to do, as callous as it was, not as barbaric as Ashford implied in the show, but how spacefaring societies operate, so I'm going to give this a negative one. So then we go back uh, to Maneo on the EK uh, when he receives a message from Evita. She tells him that she's excited about his plans to fly into the ring and tells him that she was wrong about him and that if he pulls this off, she'll be waiting for him when he gets back. And she then blows a kiss to the camera and then shows her breasts to the camera. Maneo, to say the least is excited and highly motivated. So in the novels, as I mentioned, Maneo is a lot younger and Avita, uh, Avita just had a crush. He just had a crush on Avita. However, Avita does give him an encouraging message when she hears what he's going to do uh, with the ring. And while not nearly as suggestive as it was in the show, Maneo does take it to mean that maybe he has a chance with her and it motivates him. Again, the show just pushes it to a further extreme, which is in line with the funnier story that they set up, which I like. So I'm going to give this a plus two. We then cut back to the behemoth where Drummer and Ashford are uh, watching the drug pile into the airlock on the monitor from the command center. Drummer asks them if he thinks that this makes them better and he answers that it's a step in the right direction. She retorts that this is not who they are and then walks off. 
Naomi uh, moves to follow, but Ashford stops her by asking who does she think they are. Naomi says that she agrees with the captain, but Ashford doesn't believe her. He then recounts her career choices, which end on her becoming a big hero, and asks why she is with them now. She answers that she's that now is the time for the belt to stand up and be noticed, and if not now, then never. And Ashford suggests that she tell Drummer that. Now, there's not really an equivalent uh, in the books as the drug dealer's life was not spared and Asher tended to agree with Bull's sentiments. In fact, the novels kind of played it off as if Bull was in the right to execute the drug dealer. And I don't really buy Asher's holier-than-now attitude after he put down Grigori and works for a villain like Dawes, so I'm going to give this a negative one. So then we go back to the Sun Un as uh, Melba and Ren are finishing up preparing to leave when Ren realizes that he left his flask behind so he goes back to retrieve it. Melba follows him worried that he'll see something he isn't supposed to see and sure enough he discovers the bomb that she planted. He tells her that he'll vouch for her and try to protect her but they need to report this. She simply tells him that she wished he hadn't seen that. He says that uh, he's been in fights before and asks her not to resist but then we see her do something with her mouth and then she shudders but then opens her eyes looking ready for a fight. She then plows into him screaming, knocking him onto the ground and then picks up his body like it weighs nothing and smashes it into the wall head first until he, uh, his head is smashed in and she tosses his lifeless body to the ground as she collapses to the ground herself. So in the novels, we got to see a lot more, uh, spend a lot more time with her and Ren as the two of them bond, and Ren helps her uh, navigate being the leader of a team that she's not qualified to be. But eventually, Ren finds something wrong with the Sun Un as the systems are off that will cause an explosion. He immediately calls Melba to ask her about it, and she asks if uh, he's told anyone, but he said that he didn't because he wanted her to double-check his findings first. She asks him to take a close Closer look. So when he bends down to look again, she takes, uh, she activates her enhancements and snaps his neck, instantly killing him. Now the enhancements is another thing I need to address. Has to be perfectly blunt. I think the show did a piss poor job of explaining them. I don't know anyone who knew what was going on with them that hadn't read the books or that had someone who had read the books explain it to them. So in the novels, in the scene where she approaches the gangsters in Baltimore, it was described how she had these combat in enhancement implants. Uh, she can activate them by twisting the activation tube located on the roof of her mouth by using her tongue to twist them open. By doing so, it floods her body with combat enhancement drugs that allow her to her mind to move much faster uh, so everything seems too slow to her and she can see with clarity how best to kill people and thus allows her to act much quickly than anyone else and makes her extremely deadly. In addition, it also prevents her from feeling any fear and she can kill in a very detached and clinical sort of way. However, after a few moments, it takes a toll and it causes her to get ill and vomit uncontrollably and collapse to the ground, which is why it was banned as a military drug as it's no use if it causes soldiers to suddenly collapse and vomit everywhere. But it's still available on the black market for those who can afford it. However, the novels were clear uh, that it didn't make her stronger, just quicker. As the novels described her as taking down two huge muscular men, it kept repeating that she wasn't stronger than them, but she didn't need to be. She only needed to know where to hit them to cause the most damage and kill them as quickly as possible. So that doesn't necessarily go in line with her picking up Ren like a suitcase and banging him against the wall. But more than that, the way it was described in the novels was very detailed, like she could see everything move in slow motion. It reminded me a lot of like a battle, uh, action sequence from The Matrix. And from the description, I could picture a very visually stunning and amazing visual sequence that put the viewer in Clarissa's mindset, seeing this move in slow motion as she knows exactly where to strike. 
This scene was not it. It was kind of pathetic, actually. A huge missed opportunity, as they could have made the activation of Melva's implants so visually stunning, or at the very least, they could have at least explained to the audience what these freaking implants were. So I'm going to give this a negative five. We then go back to the EK where we see Maneo approaching the ring. A Martian warship tries to warn him off, but he says that his engines are busted and he's ballistic and he'll just fire them up. They tell him to change course immediately or be fired upon, but he keeps re uh, repeating no harm, no harm. But then once he's past the point of no return, he says too late, dusters, and then sends a message to Avita telling her that he's going to make history for her. He then flies into the ring and is ripped to shreds as the ship is instantly stopped as soon as it hits the ring and the inertia rips his body apart. Now in the novels this happened a lot earlier than all the other events of the episode, possibly by months. Particularly Melba killing Ren was like much, much later. And in fact, the scientists uh, probably became more interested in the ring after it turned on once Maneo flew the ship into it. However, uh, the actuality of flying into the ring went pretty much as it did in the novels, except the Martian warships did actually fire torpedoes at Maneo, but the ship hit the ring before the, the torpedoes caught him. But either version is fine, so I'm going to give this a zero. So then back on the Rosinate, where Holden is just coming out of the bathroom and who who does he happen to see sitting on his bed but none other than Detective Joe Miller. Miller is just mumbling, uh, saying things that he said on the show before, such as there's no law on series, only cops. Holden can't believe what he's seeing, so he closes his eyes and when he opens them again, Miller is gone. So the implication here is that the ghost Miller appeared to hold in the moment the EK flew into the ring, which is different than the novels. In the novels, Miller first appeared to hold in all the way back at the end of book two, just after the protomolecule thingy lifted up off of Venus. And he told Holden, we need to talk. At the start of book three, Holden has apparently been seeing Miller off and on for over a year, and he'll often sleep in the same bed as uh, Naomi, uh, because uh, Miller won't appear because Miller only appears to him when he's alone. However, when the EK flies into the ring, Miller appears to Holden and is perfectly coherent and warns Holden of danger. As I said, the order of events is much different as this happened before Holden got the summons from Mars and before Monica Stewart came on board, so Holden believes that Miller is the one setting him up and sending him to the ring. As I mentioned before, I understand why the show held off on the Miller reveal. It works better for the timeline that the show established and it was a real creepy way to end the episode so I'm going to give this a plus one. So my final adaptation score for Delta V is a negative nine. It's not that I think this is a bad episode, I just think it pales in comparison to the source material, but not entirely as it did improve upon some things such as the introduction to the ring and Maneo's storyline, but it left out far too many story beats, particularly from the Rosinate and especially from Melba's storyline, which doesn't really work in the show. I do think the show needed more time to do these storylines justice. So that's it for my book to show comparison for The Expanse Season 3, Episode 7. I'll be back in just a few days with my book to show comparison for Episode 8. So be sure to keep an eye on my channel for that and check out my channel for many more videos and other shows such as Star Trek, Lost, and more. So be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.